Our moderator this evening is Julie C. Dow. Julie is the critically acclaimed author of many books for teens and children, including Forest of a Thousand Lanterns and Broken Wish. Her novels have earned starred reviews from Booklist, School Library Journal, and Publishers Weekly, won recognition as Junior Library Guild selections and Kids in the Next List picks, and landed on multiple best of year lists, including Yelsa and the American Library Association. A proud Vietnamese American who was born in upstate New York, she now lives in New England. Thank you so much for being here, Julie. Thank you for having me. And of course, our author this evening is Maggie Takuda Hall. Maggie is the author of the young adult novel, The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea, an indie bestseller and recipient of the Northern California Book Award in Children's Literature, as well as the picture book, uh, oh yeah, also an octopus illustrated by Benji Davies, which won a Parents' Choice Gold Award. She has an MFA in creative writing from the University of San Francisco and a strong cake decorating name. Maggie lives in Oakland, California with her children, husband, and dog. Tonight we are here to celebrate her new book, The Siren, The Song, and The Spy, the sequel to The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea. By sinking a fleet of Imperial warships, the Pirate Supreme and the Resistance fighters have struck a massive blow against the Emperor. Now, allies from across the Empire are readying themselves, hoping to bring about the end of the Conqueror's rule and the rebirth of the sea. But trust and truth are hard to come by in the complex world of mermaids, spies, warriors, and aristocrats. Who will Genevieve, lavishly dressed but washed up half dead on the uh, Wariota Island's shore, turn out to be? Is warrior Koa's kindness towards her admirable, or is his sister Kaya's sharp suspicion wiser? And back in the capital, will pirate spy Alfie really betray the Imperials who have shown him affection, especially when a duplicitous senator reveals he would like nothing better? Meanwhile, the sea is losing more and more of herself as her daughters continue to be brutally hunted, and the Empire continues to expand through profits made from their blood. The threads of time, a web of schemes, shifting loyalties, and blossoming identities converge as unlikely young allies work to forge a new and better world. I personally loved the first installment of this story for its depth, queerness, and mermaids, and I'm so far the second promises to deliver even more of it. I'm so excited for this event tonight. Please join me in welcoming Julie C. Dow and Mikey Tikka Dow. We are so, so excited to do this event, and I'm so happy to be talking to Maggie because I've been a fan of hers for a while. And we also contributed to a mermaid anthology called Mermaids Never Drown Together. So I feel like I can call her a, a co author. Yeah, totally. We were together. An <laughs> um, well, Maggie, thank you for flying all the way from California to be with us in very cold Boston tonight. Um, can you give us a brief synopsis? So The Siren, the Song, and the Spy is part of a duology. Can you give us a synopsis of the first book and then how this follows up? Yeah, so the first book follows really two point of view characters, uh, Flora, Florian, and Evelyn. And the story really centers around their romance as they kind of learn about themselves and learn about each other in a world where they've constantly been told who they're supposed to be. They kind of find love in themselves and each other when they realize like together they can write this kind of new version of themselves. And the second book picks up exactly where the first book ends, which is with uh, an antagonist from the first book named Genevieve kind of like floating toward an island. And it's so um, this book picks up with her wrecked on the shore. And every character who's in book one makes an appearance in book two. But it's really Genevieve's story. And um, there's two new characters named Koa and Kaya and Florian's brother, whose name was Alfie, are sort of like our main characters through this one instead of Flora and Evelyn because um, they have found each other and deserve to be left in peace. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it moves from this like distant shore back to where uh, sort of the colonialism in this empire is based. And it's got all of my favorite things that fantasy novels have, which is to say like kissing, murder, dragon, and spotted hyenas because I can do whatever I want. <laughs> Those are the ingredients in the perfect fantasy, in Thank my you. opinion. <laughs> uh, speaking as someone who's written a duology herself, I think that the hardest part about writing a series is that once you publish the first book, you cannot change the details. That is now canon. Yeah, no, that's a bad, that's the bad part. Exactly. Yeah, you sure get punished by your own rules that you, you really made up. You really do. You're like, <laughs> were you like, book one, Maggie, why did you write me into a corner? Oh, constantly. <laughs> I constantly just wanted to grab her by the scruff of the neck and be like, how dare you? <laughs> I've come up with these very rigid rules for this world. Yeah. Um, but there's also some freedom in that because you've already created the world that you're going to exist in. And so, 
I don't know, like just the same way where sometimes it is easier to write when you have an assignment, like where somebody's like, okay, write a story about this kind of character. It's almost easier than starting with a blank canvas in some ways. And so it was harder in some ways because it's like being forced to abide by a version of you that is eight years old at this point, right? And then it's also a real joy because you've already done all of the hardest and most arduous work of creating that world. And so you get to kind of like coast on your own creativity a little bit as well. And that's nice. Yeah, so it's like a sandbox that you've created that you can just play in and, and make your own. Yeah. The bucket's already there and the sand's already there. Totally. It's like, good news, you have a sandbox. Yeah. Bad news, you built it. <laughs> <laughs> so would you say that it was harder to write the first book or the second book, and why? Oh, definitely the first book. First so book The Mermaid, harder. The Witch, and the Sea took me eight years to write um, because I kept rewriting the beginning over and over and over again. I was like, it's not perfect yet. It's not perfect yet. It's not perfect yet. And I was just like rewrite every sentence until it was like, you know, rocks that have been kind of smoothed over by the beach, like over time, just tumbling on themselves over and over and over again. That's what the beginning of The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea was like. And for some reason, that did not invite more content from me. <laughs> um, and when my first book came out, which was uh, a picture book, I was aware, because I'd been in publishing and around books for a long time, that it was like kind of a mid-list title and it wasn't gonna be like, a New York Times bestseller, and I didn't have anything else lined up, and I was like really disheartened, and I was like, oh, I had my one shot, and now my career is over, like as an author. I guess I should just let that dream die. And I am lucky that I am married to a very encouraging person who believed in me, and we were traveling through South America at the time, and he was like, we're, how about this, we're gonna make a pact, we'll each work for an hour a day, you finish that novel, and I will work on my coding. And it happened to be November of 2016. And do you guys know NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month? Yeah, so The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea is actually a NaNoWriMo novel. I did not know that. was what finally got me to finish it. It was like the pact with my husband and then it happening to line up with exactly when NaNoWriMo yeah. began. And I was like, well, I guess I can just like participate in this. And I ended up throwing out like two thirds of what I wrote that month because it was trash. But I finally had an ending to write toward. And so like, People have asked me before in my life, like, oh, what advice do you have for like a new writer? And I'm like, well, you can't build a staircase that goes nowhere. And that's what a beginning that you keep like writing over and over and over again is like a very beautiful staircase that goes nowhere. And without an end to answer to it, all of that work like kind of doesn't matter. It's not perfect because there's nothing to answer it. And so it wasn't until I had the end and I knew kind of what I wanted the end to be that I was able to rewrite the middle to be something readable. Yeah. And that's pretty close to what uh, the first the first book is now. Yeah. I think that's the beauty of NaNoWriMo because you are supposed to write 50,000 words in 30 days. That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to write through a book in order yeah. to understand what you're writing. Sometimes you're just telling yourself a story. I find totally. my first drafts are like that. Is that, the, is that true for you? Not since then. Okay. That was the only book I had to write really? through that way. And so um, for me, NaNoWriMo really taught me how to write a novel. Like, it wasn't until I finished one that I had a sense of like, oh, here's how you do this. And then from then on, I've been able to write straight through much more confidently. But I really had to like struggle <laughs> while I played through that first one. And, and NaNoWriMo helped with that. And I think there's also some freedom in that. Like, you know you're doing this social thing. You know that most people's NaNoWriMo novels don't do anything. And so you can kind of just be more relaxed about it and enjoy the time you're having with it. And I think when I removed a little bit of the pressure and I was like, I'm just doing this for funsies, like I was able to actually enjoy the process a lot more. Because because I had come from publishing and from the book world so much, I was so aware of the quality of books on the shelf. And I think that that really got in my way of being able to even get a first draft out. So I was like, well, this isn't as good as what Rainbow Roll writes. And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> the first sentence Rainbow Roll writes isn't that good. So maybe you should chill out. Yes. And I feel like that's that's how I was able to like learn that lesson. Yes, it's, it's so hard not to compare your first draft to something that's on the shelf yes. that's been edited like 15 times. I know, it was, as soon as I say it out loud, and I think even if you'd confronted me back then, it'd been like, that's banana pants. You cannot possibly hold yourself to that standard. You are one person by themselves. And this has gone through like agents and editors and like all these people have looked at it. Why would you think that by yourself you could do that? And that is still exactly how I felt. I don't know that there's any way around that. And I do think that like a little bit of that is really healthy. Yeah. To be, so you're like humble before the craft and you're humble before the fact <laughs> that like this is a really difficult undertaking and you should come into it ready to take advice from experts and like that kind of thing. But it can also be 
like a, you, you just get left dead in the water if you listen to it too much. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't know how people get an ego in this business because I feel like I every, don't time, either. every time you write a new book, it feels like you're learning again, right? Is that yeah. true for you? Um, sort of. It's like every time I write a new story, it's like, um, it's not like I have to relearn how to write, period, but it's like, um, I, I don't know exactly how I describe it. Like somebody kicked the, the training wheels off my bicycle yeah. every time where it's like, in theory, I know how this works. Right. And yet here I am. Right. <laughs> Just finding your footing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, it's, it does get easier in some ways every time for me. Like I'm much more confident when I sit down to write that I know what I'm doing. And I've gotten to the point now with my young adult projects where I feel like if I finish something, then it's a book and it's good and that like I'm going to sell it. Um, but it's like getting to the point where it's worth finishing is yeah. I start a lot more than I'm ever going to complete. And I get more and more confident that when I leave something behind, I'm making the right choice. Such a nice way to put it. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like fantasy of all genres is pretty difficult to write because you're responsible for building an entire world and making that world have scaffolding, making sure it makes sense. So, what does fantasy world building look like for you? How do you go about doing it? A constant waking nightmare. I always joke that like I will never write fantasy ever again because <laughs> it's really difficult, and every choice you make is also an ethical decision about what is it, especially when you write for teenagers. Like, what are you telling them about the world that they exist in through all the choices you made in your world? And so, like, there are writers who I think do really beautiful work that um, basically don't let things like homophobia or transphobia or racism exist in their worlds. And I respect that kind of writing so much, but being kind of a pessimist and being a dark-minded person who lives in this world, it's like, I am unable to write that world because I don't understand what it would look like because that's been so foreign to my experience. And so when I put those kinds of things into my story, I always have to really question myself about like, why am I doing this? Why is it valuable? What is it going to do? Will it be ultimately affirming to a child who like feels like so often this genre leaves them behind? And so um, I would say it's like deeply stressful. <laughs> I spend a lot of time doing research on um, different like nations and their histories to try to like, every nation state that exists in these worlds are kind of like a smush of like a few different ones that exist in our real world. There are very few things from the different societies that I wrote about in here that don't, haven't existed at some point in history. It's just unlikely that they would have existed together, right? Like, <laughs> so like the, the Nipran uh, empire that is kind of like this seat of all this power is sort of like an American, British, Japanese nation. And I stole things from our actual histories to put in there. Um, and like the other nations, I did this as well, and like research into kind of like pre Columbian, uh, pre Incan tribes to like get a sense of like before there was any colonizing, even from other indigenous people, what did it look like here? And to like draw from those things as well to make sure that I wasn't constantly drawing from sort of European story traditions. The, best thing that I was able to do in rewriting the book after I'd written it in NaNoWriMo was audit for Western influence and be like, how many of these stories are a part of sort of like the Western storytelling tra tradition? How many of them are so distinctly British? Because when most of us grew up reading fantasy, we read British authors, right? And so like how often was I just sort of doing what I saw them doing because that's what had historically been true in my experience versus how much was actually from my like genuine perspective and reading my own fiction that way was like a really cold wake-up call for the way that like even my own imagination required like pretty arduous decolonization like really difficult work of picking apart like why do i even favor these kinds of characteristics why is thinness even present on the page like these kinds of questions are like in every decision you make in fantasy you should be you know kind of asking yourself about this stuff. And so I joke, and I don't know how much of a joke it is, that I'll never write a full second world fantasy ever again because those decisions are so complicated and I feel differently about some of those choices that I made then than I do now even. Because at this point, I wrote The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea 10 years ago, or like started it. And so there's just things from even get go that I would maybe choose differently. Now it's impossible to tell because I'm like, well, that's <laughs> That's the way it is, <laughs> and I made it, and I'm proud of it. But um, but I, I 
I do think it's nice when you read fantasy that's like our world, but werewolves, or like our world, but vampires, or like whatever it is. There's a certain amount of like ethical scaffolding that you get to just exist within that do not make any value judgments in certain ways, because it's just like, that's just the reality, right? But when you write another world, you have to create that entire system of how anything is, like any value is determined. That is stressful. <laughs> and it's even a bigger responsibility when you're writing for children, because exactly. you know that these are minds that you're forming, that you're hopefully showing them what they deserve to see. and. It's, I, I just don't understand how anyone can write a sanitized version of a fantasy. Like you were saying how they don't bring in biases, they don't bring in colonization. Like what would that look like? A Becky Chambers, Chambers novel. Fantasy? Really? Yeah, she Becky writes Chambers. these science fiction novels that are brilliant. Uh, Charlie Jean Anders writes young adult uh, science fiction, that's like kind of sci-fi fantasy. Um, and I would say like both of them have this like incredible intelligence and wisdom mm -hmm. in the way that they write but that is completely different than anything I would ever be able to do. Um, that show, uh, she wrote Princess of Power when they rebooted okay. it, like I would qualify that as being in that as well. Like, those are all nice people making mistakes, <laughs> but like ultimately, literally everyone, even the biggest bad is redeemed. Yeah. And I remember watching it and being like, my imagination will never yield that kind of story. And I'm so impressed by it. And I love that it exists. Now I'm gonna go back to my horrible world <laughs> that I have created where everything is hard and bad. <laughs> well, I like dark fantasy as well. I mean, so. I, I like it. I, I don't mean to like dunk on myself. I, but, like, I understand, I understand. But it's good to have different types of fantasy. Yeah, That's yeah, really I just like, I wanna be clear that when I say this is the way I write, it's not that I'm saying like, oh, I think my way is the way. I really appreciate that other people write this other kind of thing. And I think there's a real value in having both available to you. Like sometimes you want a shot of whiskey and sometimes you want a hug, right? And I don't know, I like being able to offer one kind of story and I know that when I write to my anger and when I write to my passion, my stories are a little darker yes. and I feel good about that. Yeah, I think they come across on the page as more genuine when you're putting in true feeling and true I mean, experience. I feel that way. I feel that way. <laughs> I, I think it's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, when you're writing about what you know. Yeah. Um, so The Siren, The Song of the Spy has a quite wide cast of characters. It's not just one POV character. What was that like writing an ensemble cast? Was it hard to hop from one character's head to another, or was it easier for you with some and then harder for others? I, I don't know if you feel this way. It's harder for me to stick with one character than it is for me to move around. Um, because when I think about a situation, I naturally consider all the different people who are involved. And so writing that way to me feels incredibly natural. And I also like writing unstuck in time. Like I like flashing back and forward between a character's present and a thing that they are remembering and trying to time that correctly so that when they are in a moment of recollection, it informs the next scene that you're gonna read with them in the present. Um, and I think I like that because that is how my mind functions in real life. Like when I'm making decisions, I'm often reflecting on something that has already happened in my life or something that I have witnessed and applying it to this current moment. And when I am trying to make sense of a situation that I'm having a hard time with, I naturally wonder what everyone around me is bringing to this situation that adds a complexity or that is making it uh, confusing to me and to try to like clarify it in my own mind. I do a lot of that work and so to me, I'm like, yeah, this makes perfect sense. And other people are like, that's bananas. <laughs> and I appreciate that both are valid opinions. <laughs> Well, nobody lives in a vacuum, so like you said, every yeah. character is affected by the people around them, the opinions around them, Yes, and they can grow because of the people around them as well. Yeah, and I think especially in the first book with Flora Florian's gender being so situationally dependent, yeah. it makes the presence of other characters bear a lot more weight, mm -hmm. and so it was impossible not to consider their backgrounds and all the story that they were bringing to every interaction that they had with him. So it was like, yeah, of course. Like They would be bringing all of their biases, all of their experiences to the table when they're just talking to this random kid. And they aren't necessarily thinking about that, but like, that's kind of how gender functions in society. Is like we just sort of say what we think is normal without <laughs> any concept of how many different biases are baked into those, like, that value judgment of normalcy. And so, um, and I think especially with the first book that like that's where I really honed that sense of discipline of like considering everyone's each character. Yes. And then by the time I got to the second book, which I wrote many years after I'd written the first book, 
I was much more confident as a writer and much more sure of what I do. And so bouncing around different perspectives was like, just felt free and great. And that kind of, if you ever sit down and write a book, the best part is that you get to do whatever you want and no one can stop you. Like it's your imaginary world. And so, especially because the second book is so much about nations and like war and like these big concepts that involve so many people and collective identity, it became even more important to me to show many different perspectives as that story unfolded. And I love that you brought up gender because that's the next thing I was about to ask. <laughs> yeah, I love the exploration of gender across different cultures in your book. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong in pronouncing this, but the war you took? So it's an ancient pre-Incan tribe name. Okay. I have no idea how it would probably okay. be pronounced. It's okay. like in a dead language. Right. So that's what a text panel at a museum in Colombia said. <laughs> okay. So um, the colonizers seem to be patriarchal, mm -hmm. but the Warayuta are often led by women. Can you talk a little bit more about writing a um, women-led so culture? So glad you asked. <laughs> so the Warayuta also have spotted hyenas, as they're familiars. And spotted hyenas have a matrilineal society, oh. which is that um, rank is inherited and it's inherited down the mother's line and so they basically have like royalty and like you know like really complex social structure oh, you have royalty mm -hmm. okay. they do yeah and it's inherited uh usually mother to daughter but there's the possibility of sons kind of jumping in there if they're competent and strong enough they just okay. tend to be smaller because they're a sexually dimorphic animals so the males tend to be smaller than the females um and I love spotted hyenas so much. They've been called the queers of the animal kingdom, and that was sort of why I focused on them so much. And so the Warayuda culture is based, like that aspect of it is based on the hyena social structure, and that's why they keep hyenas as their familiars. It was sort of like my nerdy nod to like any zoology buffs that are in the room of like, yes, we are talking about that animal where the male and females both have penises, correct. Yeah. Um, if you really want to have a strong laugh and a weird day, I highly recommend Googling or YouTube searching spotted hyenas mating. It is one of the funniest things you will ever see in your life. You're welcome. So nice to see you children. <laughs> it's science. <laughs> I love that their familiars are hyenas. I was going to ask you what your familiar would be, but a I feel hyena. like it would be a hyena. What would your hyena's name be, and what would they be like? You know what? I say it's a hyena. I feel like that's aspirational. Okay. Like, that's who I wish I was. And if I was really honest, my my familiar would be like a seagull. Or someone that's like constantly begging for food. <laughs> a nuisance to the people around it. <laughs> Um, but if I if I had a hyena, it would probably have one of the names that I gave the hyenas in, in the novel. I, like um, I, I liked Tupac. I, that was my favorite hyena name. A pre-Incan emperor. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> yep. Um, so we talked earlier about Mermaids Never Drown, which is the mm -hmm. anthology that we both wrote a story for. Yes. And then this story, of course, is called The Siren, the Song, and the Spy. So sirens are a big part of your creativity. Can you explain why that is and what about them draws you to them, to write them? Um, gosh, I mean, this is my only book with a siren in it. My story in Mermaids Don't Drown is actually about a girl whose um, mother was a mermaid who made a deal with a sea witch and um, so that she could be with this girl's dad. But the price was that their child would be cursed. So when she gets her period, she like sprouts all these sharp teeth and has to like stay home from school and it's deeply humiliating. And she's kind of like uh, burdened with the baggage of her parents' romance for like the rest of her life. And it's a, the short story is about her falling in love for the first time. Um, and with the siren in this book, she's like a disgusting little murderer. Like she just she only wants to kill you. She's not a good person. She likes kind of emotionally torturing people. She is exsanguinated many of the villagers who live around her. And I love anything from sort of like collective mythology that is supposed to be a beautiful woman and undercutting that with something deeply grotesque mm -hmm. is always like really satisfying and uh, cathartic for me. Absolutely. So I like many people who are my age, like The Little Mermaid was like yes. the first Disney movie I was allowed to see in the theaters and like the first like scary movie and like I imprinted on the mermaid thing like pretty hard mm -hmm. right then. Mm -hmm. But even then I was aware that it represented a kind of being a girl that I would never be. She was like tiny and beautiful and white and she had bright red hair and her neck was the same width as her waist. And I just like was like, oh, I, 
I love this, but I also know that I will never be this. And there was like kind of a sense of like deflation, even as like a really little kid about that. And so when I became a writer and realized I get to use these tropes, but make them feel the way I felt as a teenager specifically, which was grotesque. Cause like you're getting your periods for the first time, it's a nightmare. Like your body is unwieldy and doing things you didn't ask it to do. And like things are just happening that feel wrong and strange. I don't know if you felt this way, but I always felt kind of like, did, yeah. yeah, like a broom that was shoved into a bag, <laughs> you know, like that kind of just like something's wrong. Uh, <laughs> And then when you take these tropes and you put the, you make them grotesque, it's my way of nodding to that kid and being like, it's fine. We all feel like disgusting little monsters. If you relate to her, so do I. <laughs> I'm drawn to monster women too. Yeah. I think because women who are outwardly beautiful are kind of falling into that expected stereotype, but then they've got this hidden horror and they could cut your head off or they can, yes. you know, suck your blood or whatever. Right, and there's also the thing of like, we're not allowed to have feelings or like selfish emotions. Right. And so having any one of them be like, I'm angry yes. or I'm horny yes. or I'm disgusting or yes. like whatever it is, is also really freeing. I'm just mm -hmm. like, yeah, she, she does the thing you're asking her to do. She'll just also murder you. For sure. Seems fair. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's perfect. Um, do you have any advice? I mean, we were talking about this, but do you have any advice for aspiring writers who would like to be published someday? My advice for teens and adults is largely the same, with one exception, which is I don't think that teenagers should seek publication. Hmm. Because I do not think that adults who are willing to work with children are adults who should be trusted. Hmm. It's labor. When you're a writer, you're a laborer and you should take labor laws into account in those moments. And the reason that those are there is because employers, even wonderful ones like publishers, are there to make as much money as they can. And sometimes that happens at personal expense to laborers. And so I don't trust adults to shepherd children through that experience, nor do I think children should be experiencing it. I think that they should be using that time to make as many mistakes as is humanly possible to make out with the wrong people, to read as many books as they can, to just like be a full person and learn themselves before they are putting professionalism demands on themselves. Because that's a different world. Mm -hmm. And I believe that they are capable of doing it. I just don't trust anyone who would, who would be willing to make money off that child, yeah. right? Yeah. But beyond that, for adults or kids, I always say that the real difference between a professional and a hobbyist is that professionals finish. That's it. You have to finish the draft. And like, it's amazing how few of us, no matter how talented you are, no matter how hard you worked on it, if there is no ending, it's not a book. Like you can't sell a, a thing that is three fourths of the way done or five sixths of the way done or seven eighths of the way done, it has to be done. And so just, forcing yourself to get to the ending, even if it's not good yet, is better than building a beautiful staircase to nowhere yes. for eight years. I can't stress that enough. <laughs> eight years. <laughs> Were you traumatized by that? <laughs> yes, Julie, thank you for asking. Is this my therapy? Because I have more things to say. <laughs> I mean, it could be. Um, so what are you working on now? Can you share anything about your current project or a uh, hint at something? Yeah, I'm actually um, almost done with the sequel to Squad. Okay. Um, so I wrote a graphic novel about teenage girls who um, turn into werewolves at the full moon and find the worst boy at a party they can and eat him. And uh, book one is done and it's out and I'm very proud of it. And I am just finishing up literally like the last scene of it for mm -hmm. book two. Nice, that's exciting. Um, and then my last question is, is there is one project that you would really want to write someday? Do you have a genre in mind or Yes, character? and I want to know your answer to this too. Okay. Because I feel like all writers have a secret, like Don yes. Quixote windmill that we're tilting at. We do. Mine is a good ghost story. And I, because I write really uh, like plotty books and I feel like ghost stories are so like ruminative yeah. and like beautiful and emotional. And I like, I want to write like a slow, spooky, mm -hmm. ooky ghost story that like makes your skin crawl, but doesn't make you go like, Ugh. right? Like yes. that, I don't know. There's like a certain feeling of a good ghost story where you're just unsettled, Yes. right? Yeah. I want to write one of those. Yes. I've tried like 900 times. <laughs> What's yours? Well, I was just going to say, have you seen Mike Flanagan's shows on Netflix, The Haunting yeah. of Hill House? Of the course, of it's Manor. exactly my jam. So the romantic, yes. gothic ghost yes. story, where yes. it's more about the trauma than it is about the ghosts. 
Yes. I feel like you would knock that out of the park. You'd think. I feel you would. Thank you for your confidence, but I would like to say that experience disagrees. <laughs> I'll try it again because I really want to read it. Yeah. Um, for me, I'm also wanting to move into the horror realm, so I would love to write a horror, horror novel. So good. Yes. I yes, love we'll have horror. To see. We'll have to see if I can pull it off. But I think you can. I would like it. Thank yeah, you. I think you can yeah. do it. <laughs> So great, thanks Maggie for talking. Um, why don't we move to audience Q&A. If anyone has a question, we are open to anything you might have to ask. It goes so much better if someone asks the first yes. question. Yeah. yeah. This is for both of you. How did you know that you wanted to be writers? Did you have to write your hand at it first? Was it just this inherent since you were five years old thing? Do you wanna go first? I was not an early to life reader or writer. I really struggled with reading as a kid. And so the idea of being a writer was like a million years away. Um, and when I was in high school and in college, I was like good at drawing and like painting. And so I had a lot of teachers really offer me a lot of support in that and like push me in that direction. So that's actually what my degree is in. Um, but it became apparent to me while I was in college that the reason I liked visual art was for the opportunity to tell a story. All of my work was always really narrative, and the most interesting part about anything that I ever did was the story that was behind it, not what I actually turned out, because I was actually deeply mediocre at visual art. Um, and so it took me a long time to get there, and I would say like even into my adult life when I was like, oh, I would really love to be a writer, I lacked the confidence to do it. I got an MFA in writing, which I don't actually recommend. Uh, because I was in a program, and I was the only person interested in writing for kids. I don't, do you have an MFA? I do not. Yeah, you didn't need one. She has more books than me, no MFA. Uh, <laughs> um, and you do workshops, and so everyone reads your work, and having a bunch, and gives you feedback. And if you use workshops well, it is an opportunity to learn how to give people feedback that's really difficult, really kindly. But while people are learning how to workshop, they destroy each other. Because that's kind of the natural inclination, is you want to have the pithy comment. You want to be the one who says the smartest, most devastating thing. And so what ends up happening in MFA programs like the one I was in is that it is basically an insult competition. And if you are a person who's made of marshmallows on the inside with the disposition of a golden retriever who just wants everyone to like them, that is deeply disheartening. And so from the time that I graduated after my MFA program to when I started writing again was almost seven years because it had like knocked the wind out of my sails so hard. And in that time, I worked around books and I was like, maybe I'll be an agent, maybe I'll be an editor, because I just loved stories. But I was like, I don't have the chops to be a writer. And I was like, no, that's not true. You just don't have the chops to hang out with a lot of really mean people all the time <laughs> while you're learning a craft. Um, I, I think it's so interesting how so many of us come from completely different yeah. walks of life, different feelings toward books. I was a young writer. So I wrote my first book when I was nine. I've always loved reading. Um, and I started out reading fairy tales, reading everything I could get my hands on. I was a voracious reader. My teachers had to stop me from reading in class. And so I wrote my first book when I was nine and it was my parents who stopped me. So I wrote you know, up until high school and my parents are Vietnamese immigrants, very much um, you know, go into STEM, don't be a writer, you're not gonna make any money, you're gonna starve, you're not gonna be good at it. And so I stopped writing for a really long time and I felt like I had turned my back on something that was really truly me. And so after college, so I majored in pre-med biology, big mistake, because I'm not a scientific brain at all. Uh, but I was working in a lab and just feeling so unhappy in my early 20s. And I went back into writing and it was kind of with this arrogance of, of youth where, you know, I had always been praised in school. I was always the best writer in school. I always was good at reading, at spelling, and so I'm like, oh, publishing, it's a piece of cake. I'm gonna get published like that. I did not get published like that. It took me just eight years to get an agent. Only eight years of my life. Um, but during that time, I just grew as a writer. I learned everything I could about the craft. I studied the publishing industry. So for a lot of us, it's not the very first book that we publish, no matter how much you love. It's just trying to figure out where your storytelling power lies and what feels genuine to you and just how to build on your craft. So it took me a really long time to get here, but I feel like I'm where I should be, which is a really great place. And I hope you feel that way too, because you're a great writer. Oh, thank you, you too. Great question. Yeah. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. 
Yes, Stephanie Cannon, my publicist. <laughs> um, you kind of touched on it already a little bit, but I'm just kind of wondering when you go into you know, writing your first book, even for both of you, and then you go into doing a sequel, did you always know that you want to do a sequel? Or were you like, this first book is perfect, I don't need to tell any more of this story, and then that just like changes one day or something? Like did you ever look at any of your books and be like, this is perfect? <laughs> <laughs> All of them, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, it's not a second. <laughs> really? None of them ever. Okay, yeah, me neither. Um, even after they're published. Oh, especially after they're published. <laughs> I feel like there's like a minute where you lull yourself into a false sense of security when you've turned in your last draft to your editor. Yep. And then when it's too late and you get the art, you're like, mmm, I have space for me. Um, uh, I, I don't know about you. I had planned The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea in my brain as a trilogy. And then after we sold the first book, we were doing edits, so I was like, hey, what's the deal with the other books? Are you guys going to, like, buy them or what? And they're like, oh, we'll see how book one does. And I was like, oh, I have to change some stuff right now. <laughs> because the whole point of The Mermaid, The Wish, and the queer romance, that was the whole point. I wrote it for a specific kid. She used to come into I got to know her there, and then eventually her parents hired me to be her creative writing tutor. And I tutored her from the time she was like 11, 10 or 11 till she graduated high school. And then I actually like mentored her on her college thesis as well. But when she was like 12 or 13, it became clear that like she was queer and she didn't have the language for it yet. But she was this big fantasy reader. And so that's how I started The Mermaid, The Witch and Sea. was like, I'm gonna write her the book that she deserves. That like centers this sapphic romance it also has this gender queer character because like I wasn't sure how she would develop and like she's sensed like she's cis, she's she her and has kind of an uncomplicated relationship with it now but when she was that age it was a little bit more complicated and I wanted to make sure that in every way she saw herself in this story and that it had this like grand happily ever after, sorry spoiler, grand happily ever after ending for them because she deserved that and so when I didn't know if I was going to get the sequel, I was like, well, they have to end happily ever after, like, right now, because I am not going to, like, leave this in a question where that's not clear, because originally it ended with, like, a cliffhanger of, like, them not being short, like, Flora Florian thinking Evelyn was dead, Evelyn being like, well, where is he? Uh, and I was like, I can't end that way, like, it cannot, like, I will death first, like, I'm not ending this book that way. So when I did get the sequel, it required a lot of like revamping to like, because their story was over. And I feel really good about where their story ended because that was where they were intended to end. But I knew that all this other stuff was going on in the world that I was like really excited to get to. And so that was when um, the focus really landed on Genevieve even harder than it had originally in my mind. That made me tear up a little bit when you wrote that book for Claire. I'm sure she felt very important and she, you know, she felt special, which every kid should feel when they're reading books. I So Mermaid came out like height of the pandemic, which mm -hmm. was a super chill time to debut your <laughs> novel. <laughs> um, and I like drove it to her house in San Francisco and like left it on the porch and like waited at the car and then she like came out and picked it up and like hugged it to her chest. And it was just like one of those life moments where it's like, okay, no matter what else happens in my career, like that's done. Yeah. This has been, yeah. that's enough. Everything else after that's been extra. That's so lovely. It's good to have a highlight like that. Yeah. Um, for me, I've been lucky to get multi-book deals. So I've always known that my first book delivered, I would have to write a second, a follow-up to that book. So my first book that I ever published was back in 2017. I can't believe it's been that long. But it was called Forest of a Thousand Lanterns. And it is the story of the evil queen from Snow White set in a fantasy Asia. And as soon as I started planning that story, I knew I wanted the story to have a foil, so a second part where the Snow White character would get to tell her story. So it was always going to be a duology, so I knew that that would be a series. Yeah. And then for my middle grade series, um, we got a three book deal for that. So I had so much fun coming up with different adventures for the kids. And I actually sent my publisher a couple of months ago, like 15 ideas for new books. And they said the same thing that your publisher said to you. They're like, well, we'll have to see how these books that are out do. Yeah. But I'm like, I have 15 ideas, so give me more books and I'll write them all. Um, I really like writing series. Yeah. It's very different. 
It is. Like, it it's is. like thinking about like writing a movie versus writing a sitcom, exactly. right? Where it's like, you need them to grow, but not too much. Yes. And you need things to change, but not that much. Like, yeah. It's like a very interesting... Yeah. It's like, like a study in knowing where to hold back. Like you were saying, you have to yeah. change the ending of, yeah. of Mermaid. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, just figure it out. Yeah. Wondering if you, either of you have writing rituals. When you write what part of the day, how long, or just, yeah, writing rituals. Good question. Question. So I had this question on the list that I sent to Maggie, and she immediately texted back and said, I'm not going to have a great answer to this. <laughs> I'm a mess, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I thought we could go back. Yeah, yeah talk um, about that. Maybe there's no ritual, and you... Yeah, you know that you feeling when you sneeze, and you're like, oh, it's got to come out. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're done sneezing. <laughs> That's what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't really have a ritual. I just try to write those days of the week. Um, I'm really lucky that I get to do this full time for now. I'm always planning an escape plan. I'm always like, what happens when I don't get to publish books anymore? Yep. People are like, no, we're sick of you. Um, so I, I try to write, you know, mostly in the morning and afternoon. I worked a nine to five job for so long that I cannot write after dark. After dark, after dinner is my time to watch Netflix and just kind of chill out and rest my brain. Yeah. So I can only write when the sun's up, which is a little bit weird, but whatever. I'm the same, actually. Are you? Do you have more ritual than I'm realizing? I think you do. Yeah, because you kind of have just to. Like, when you're on a deadline, you have to have a deadline. Yeah. You, have, you have to be like, yeah. okay, I'm going to write a thousand words a day. And right. some days you're like, clickety-clack. And some days you're like, I wish death would come for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, like how many hours can you work? It totally depends on how strong the sneeze is. Right? Like when I know exactly what I'm doing, I can write all day and like my whole body gets stiff and I look like the Skeksis from Dark Crystal, like emerging from a cave at the end of the day and I feel great. And when I don't know what I'm doing, when I'm writing around a story and I'm trying to figure out what character it is, where the meat is, like that walking around that you have to do. And often that's with novels that I don't finish. It's like, uh, like torture to get through an hour. And so like it really is like, People joke about like inspiration or muses or whatever, and it's like, I don't know. I've really come to accept that I have boom and bust periods with my creativity, and that when I'm in a bust period, it is perfectly appropriate to spend that time reading and watching movies and collecting craft lessons from every other expert in the field, so that when I sit back down again, I'm coming with like renewed interest and new lessons that I've learned. I don't know if you feel this way. I think every time you write, you sit down to write, you get a little bit better. Right? And that's why like, I don't hold on to anything that I've written and I'm not gonna finish. I delete it. Like I like light it on fire. It goes in the trash and I like eject it from the computer. I don't save really? any old sentences. I don't save any old anything. Wow. Because I feel like that is like stringing along a dead or old version of you behind oh, wow. you like baggage. <laughs> and every time you write, you're getting better and you'll remember all the best stuff. Like if you have a line that's like a real zinger, like you'll find a way to sneak it in. Or if there's a character that you love, you'll find an excuse to, yeah. like you'll find the story that's right for them. Yeah. But like, yeah. I don't know if that's ritual, but it's like yeah. as close to like process for me is every time it's new. And if I'm copy pasting, then I'm not doing my best work. And then what's the point, right? And so I, I don't let myself do that anymore. That's amazing, you couldn't be me because I keep everything everything, all of my worst writing, all of my bad stories, I put them in a Word document and I don't look at them. I just dump them there. And sometimes I'll go back and I'll look at it. I'm like, this wasn't as bad as I thought it was. And then I can integrate it into a new story. So, so many writers I'm write you like, dead carcass that including you were about. Mitali Perkins, like there are so many yeah. talented, much more successful than me authors who write that way. And so like, it's not that either one is correct or incorrect, exactly. yeah. but for me personally, yes. I have to yeah. start fresh every time. I like that. I like that you exercise your old writing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's funny, like the same themes carry through like a story that I couldn't quite pull off. Like, in fact, the, the themes of the way that gender is explored in The Mermaid, The Witch and the Sea, like you could argue was from my thesis novel, from my MFA program, which was also largely about gender and the way that you could be socialized as one and like, I don't know. Anyway, it just and had spotted hyenas. Like it had a lot of things that were like, I'm clearly stealing from myself, but I didn't need to force that novel into a better shape. I needed to just take what was best from it and move on with my life. And so that's what worked for me.
you sit down and write for hours at a time, or do you do it in short bursts, or does it depend? Like you said. Yeah, like, uh, yeah it's like okay. how strong the sneeze is. Okay. Like Got there it. are days yeah. where um, yeah like a god of brilliant yes. productivity. Yes. And then there are days like today where I was like, I should really work. And then, <laughs> well, you're touring, so it's always hard when you're That touring. was my excuse. Yes. Yes. I was like, oh, this is so <laughs> weird. <laughs> it's an excuse, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the steady downhill toward 40, so I cannot sit for longer than half an hour without extreme pain in my shoulders and I mean, me neck. neither, but that doesn't stop me from doing it. <laughs> and I'm hunching over. So I, I usually do um, Pomodoros, so I set my phone for 30 minutes and then I'll just write straight through. No getting up to pee, no getting up to get snacks, just trying to focus as much as I can. But I'm also a plotter, so I generally know what I'm gonna write I'm next. Answer. You're a pantser, so See, you write by the seat of your pants. So when we were organizing for this event last week, Julie was like, here are all the questions. Do you wanna get dinner at this restaurant beforehand? Like, here's what I was thinking, and I was like, I am not there yet mentally. I was so impressed. The fact that this is next week is a shock. <laughs> Like there's a lot of like fundamental personality yes, differences. Yes. It's like if you had to create a spectrum from like organized <laughs> to disorganized, I feel like you've done it. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm a hot, anxious mess, so that's why I'm. Well, so it doesn't organized. absolve me of anxiety. I would say that is my primary way of being. <laughs> so I guess we have that in common. Look at us go. Look at us, and we still produce books. So yeah, we always get to the same end result. I know that's what's wild. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I have like a really firm ethical stance with how I write all of my kids' books, which is that no matter what I'm writing about, even if it's like goofy, like there's mermaids or there's werewolves or whatever, is that I tell kids the truth. That's it. Like, and so there's some fundamental truths about what it means to be marginalized in these works. There's also some fundamental truths to me about what it means to be privileged. And I was not interested in dumbing that down for kids who are of an age that they are likely experiencing those things. So if I've written this for middle grade, it would look really different. But I don't have a middle grade sensibility in my work. And I, I think, and I wonder what you think about this, I think that all writers in some way, or all artists, but specifically kids writers, there's an age that you get kind of stuck in, in some way. There's some sort of emotional, work or transformation that happened to you at a certain age. And so there is a point of reference that stays there. This isn't to say you don't grow up and get wiser and you know better or whatever, but there's just like some fundamental part of your heart that like will always remember exactly what it felt like to be 16. And I'll always remember exactly how it felt to be 16. And I remember feeling really disenchanted at that age because it was when I really started understanding that people who loved me deeply had told me a lot of really well-meaning lies about what the world was. That it was a meritocracy, that if I just worked hard, everything would work out okay because things were fair. That the world was fair at all. That um, the people in charge understood what they were doing and that they were making the best choices with everybody's best interests in mind. There was a lot that I was starting to see that made me really angry and I think that no matter what, there's a certain amount of anger in your adolescence that's just due to brain chemistry and what it takes to establish independence from your parents or whoever raised you, and anger is a part of that. But I do also suspect that particularly in American culture, there is extra anger that comes from feeling like you've been lied to for a really, really, really long time. And so when I write for kids, even really, really little kids, I tell the truth. And on that stone cold bummer of an answer. <laughs> I think it's uplifting. Oh, I think that's yeah. a positive. I think, I think that kids deserve the truth and that they're smarter than a lot of people give them credit for. Oh, and that they deserve to see their world um, through the lens of fantasy, which can sometimes make it more palatable, but they're still dealing with very real world issues that they yeah. see every day. Yeah, I mean, I obviously yeah. agree. And I also think that often when we don't tell the truth, when we're doing things, we're doing it to protect ourselves. We're not doing it to protect kids. 
And we give ourselves these really arrogant excuses about how kids couldn't handle it, but they do. They, do. they handle it all the time because they live in our world, so they are aware of what is going on around them. And so it does not do anything for their development to mince words about that. I don't mean like you have to take your four-year-old by the ears every night and be like, we all die alone <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> but I do think that there's like, I don't know, I'm of the mind, at least as a parent, like when my son asks me a question and the answer is racism, I tell him the truth. And he doesn't always understand everything that I'm saying, but I want him to have the foundation of that language going forward. Yeah. It's like, if the answer is inequality, if the answer is global warming, he gets that answer and he's like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy's talking a lot again. But I hope that at the very least, like I know he's gonna be angry in his adolescence because like I said, like that's just part of it. But I never want him to feel like I lied to him. That's like the hard ethical stance I've taken as a parent and as a writer. Yeah, it's about respect, having respect for the kids. Exactly. How much they can handle. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think you did that beautifully in this book, Simon the Song the Spy. And I hope everyone picks up a copy and enjoys it because I certainly did. And Julia's um, books as well. <laughs> um, and pick up Mermaids Never Drown too because we yes. have banger stories in there. Yes. I'm not gonna lie. That anthology is yeah. one of the best anthologies I've ever read, and I'm not saying that just because I was part of it. And because you wrote a good else's story, for it. Yeah. really good. <laughs> <laughs> I love Shark Week. Thank um, you. But yes, yes, very good stories from Maggie. Thank you so much for thank you, Julie. being here, and congratulations on your book. And we will be signing afterward for anyone interested. Thank so you. So thanks to thank all of you for being here. Oh,